This conference will now be recorded. Hello, good morning, everybody, and welcome to this third seminar uh, dedicated to energy sufficiency and organized under the Federal umbrella. Uh, so I introduce myself. My name is Marie-Laure Falkevasse, and I'm working for, for AREC, uh, which is uh, Department Energy and Climate of l'Institut Paris Région in, in France. So we have this morning um, another interesting uh, program. Um, maybe next slide, just uh, to inform you that we are going to ask some questions uh, la slido.com. So you can maybe install slido.com with the code hashtag efficiency 3 this morning. Uh, Melissa will tell us uh, further afterwards. Uh, so I said it was. It is another very interesting program this morning with four excellent speakers. Uh, we have a, a presentation from Ireland, Benny McDonald, on energy consumption and demand needs for our digital economy. Uh, afterwards, Bella Lotto from Paris in France with How Green Is Your IT? And uh, also Xavier Verne from France also. Uh, will speak about the rebound effect. And Anna Tizov from the Netherlands um, will uh, tell more about the Mobistai project. Uh, and we will have time also for discussion uh, during this uh, morning um, with, that will finish at about uh, noon. Next slide, please. <coughs> Excuse me. So don't, don't hesitate to watch our previous webinars, uh, which uh, were dealing with uh, consumers and buildings for the first one and mobility and public space for the second one. Uh, this uh, webinar can be uh, reviewed uh, review on uh, the Federal website. Next slide. So uh, just a quick introduction on energy sufficiency concept as it is important um, to highlight the difference between sufficiency and efficiency. So efficiency um, is dealing with the prioritization of essential needs and this is the first axis of the energy transition uh, policy. Next slide please. Uh, how can we define the energy sufficiency? It is an approach that aims to reduce energy consumption through changes in behavior, lifestyles, and collective organization. So energy sufficiency is therefore defined by what is a matter of lifestyle choices and therefore behavioral choices, thus differencing it from energy efficiency, which uses only technologies that reduce energy consumption at the scale of a given object or system. And never remember that the goal is not the product, but it is the service. I don't need a car, I need to travel. I don't need a computer, but I need to work, to exchange, or to entertain, by example. Next slide. And, um, we can also qualify, qualify uh, sufficiency with uh, uh, according to four axes. Uh, the dimensional sufficiency, uh, which is dealing with the correct dimensioning of facilities in relation to their conditions of use. By example, the uses of vehicles adapted in weight, volume, and power to the use of local and interurban travel. Um, user sufficiency, uh, that is to say the proper use of equipment with a view to reducing consumption, by example, speed limit on the road. The collaborative sufficiency, dealing with the mutualization of equipments and their use, and by example, this can be the mutualization of printers. And the structural sufficiency uh, means that creating in the organization of pace or our activities the conditions for moderation of our in our consumption by example land use planning 
with the view to reducing the distances we have to travel to work or to shops. And now I will give the floor to our first speaker, um, Benny, uh, Benny McDonough from the Limerick Institute of Technology in Ireland. Uh, so Benny, you have the floor. You can hear me? Would you like me to turn on the camera? Good morning all, thanks very much uh, for inviting me to speak. Um, I'm standing in for Seamus Hoyne, who couldn't make it today, from the Limerick Institute of Technology. Uh, my background wouldn't be expertise in the digital economy. I come from sustainable energy and uh, and uh, sustainable building construction uh, area. So greetings from snowy Ireland in our passive office um, with minus one degree outside. So share my webcam. So I'll just move on. So I'm here to talk about the um, the digital economy and the ICT sector, which at the moment currently uses 7% of our global electricity, which is projected to um, raise by 2030 to 20%. Uh, it's currently generating 2% of our global CO2 emissions. That's on par with aviation, the aviation sector, which is quite a large sector currently. Um, Data centers are the biggest um, section of this, um, of the ICT sector. These are estimated to grow and they're predicted by 2040 to reach 14% um, of uh, global emissions. And the, EU, the UN has, has, um, has looked into this situation and their international telecommunications uh, union have now um, set a target of reducing the emissions and the energy use by well the energy they 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 reduce together by 45 percent in the next decade so um by 2022 because the because of the the um the the growth in data transmission the four and 5g networks are expected to carry 83 percent of the mobile traffic and the reduction in the 2g networks to about one percent um so moving into the European uh, sector, we are now using uh, that 2018 um, estimate is 40 to 8 to 55 terawatt hours per year in, in data center energy consumption. That uh, graphic there is just a quick overview of the um, of the of a data center, the mains in the backup generation, um, and there's a bit of an explanation at the bottom that you can have a, a look at uh, the cooling and the uh, the um, the UPS systems, which are quite large users of the energy of the overall of the overall system. Right, moving on. Um, so. Growth is quite rapid in this sector because of the, the, the requirements of more energy and more data, more storage. Uh, factors that are influenced in this would be cloud computing, so people are using the off, offline to, to work on, on, on uh, from, from their offices and from home, which has changed a little bit in the last year. Um, smart devices, Internet of Things, uh, autonomous driving, um, smart buildings, energy, uh, energy data being analysed and, 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 and moved around the world. The speed of this to reduce the latency obviously requires 5G networks and wider bandwidth. Um, so this is higher energy use and higher um, emissions use. And then storage, of course, of of, of data is um, is uh, exponentially rising as well as more information has been out there. I suppose one of the things we don't need, I don't need a hundred photographs of my sandwich uh, from last week. Probably one will do. So there's a reduction in in data storage being looked at also. So data centers are quite hungry for power. They use a lot, quite a lot. They can go from half a kilowatt, two and a half kilowatts per square meter, up to 10, which has kind of been reduced and looked at. So the the, the benchmark for data energy efficiency is a PUE, power usage effectiveness, and it compares the ratio of the, the, the equipment to the overall site use. And uh, one is the, is the minimum, that is, the, is the least possible one you can have. Um, at the moment, the international average is 1.7. It's been, it's been uh, expe expected to be reduced over the coming years. Uh, so in in the Europe uh, con in the European context, you can see from this graph here that um, that um, Dublin and London are, are in the top five um, uh, data center uh, developing markets in the world after the other three in the in the bullet point there. And 
other other European countries are being used as well, and expanding this this requirement for expansion of data, uh, travel of information and storage. So Irish data centres currently have a 480 megawatt demand, which is 10% of the Irish Irish uh, electrical load, which is be it, it is a it is a, con a concern and it's a matter for for being for being looked at in Ireland because this is expected to grow exponentially as well over the next few years. So in the context of why Europe and why Ireland would be good 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 uh, sites for for data centres, I suppose we have we have a, a, a very good climate for for um, temperate climate in Europe. Um, overall on a, a, an annual average which is ideal for where the air outside is colder than the air required inside in the in the data center so this it can can uh, reduce the requirement for air conditioning and just use re free cooling um, which will lower energy costs and make these make the uh, and make the, um, the the siting of these of these data centers more attractive the connectivity because we're centralized in between America I suppose the Russian area the east and the, and the, and the south Gives us better, better latency, low latency links to all these areas. And in energy, then in Europe and in Ireland at the moment, our, our um, mix of renewable energies is, is is high. I think Ireland is is the second highest in Europe after Denmark. Our grid is 33%. With our target for um, stipulate in the latest program for government to be 20, 70% by 2030. Uh, our close, our small foot like. Um, geographical footprints mean that we're, we can be close to, to built up areas that have requirement for um, use for this waste heat which means that we're not just generating the heat to for the generating the electricity the heat for the for the data to power the data and, and then dumping it that we're actually utilizing which re reduces footprints across many different sectors and we have quite a stable environment we don't have huge amounts of um, natural disasters um, so this makes them a, a, a more a stable place for for risk, a reduce of risk of flooding and earthquakes and various other and we are, we're, we're quite politically stable as well which decreases the risk of <clears throat> of of of, a, of, a, of an investment in these areas excuse me <clears throat> I have four minutes. So, so the the future of the digital infrastructure in comparison, in combined with the energy with energy um, uh, air, sector, would be that we're planning for by 2050 in Europe to have net zero emissions of of um, in all sectors. So the, this to 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 increase improve this in in um, in the, the the digital sector would be reducing the PEU of of would have a few a huge effect. Uh, from data centers, we can utilize renewable energy systems for this. So many of uh, many of our large um, uh, of our large network network um, companies in Ireland are actually um, are, are are now net net zero balance of energy use. They're bought, but they're buying into renewable energy systems of their own. They're using power purchase agreements on, both on and off site to to make their energy balance zero. Uh, for renewables, um, there's a lot of of scrutiny and assessment of the credentials of corporations these days. I suppose um, in the last ten years, um, the 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 corporate social responsibility has become more of an issue. There's a, in our in Europe, um, there's been a best practice for guidelines for data centres, and we've a lot of directives and statutory instruments that are 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 mandating reduction in energy use and energy balance of large uh, large large proportions of the of the of this sector uh, in Ireland at the moment now we're 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 trying out our first it's an under construction uh, district heating and cooling opportunity in um, South County Dublin where a data center waste heat from a data center has been harvested into an energy center and it will be used to to supply the heat load to uh, County council, public buildings, residential and commercial buildings. And this will be a a, um, a commercial operation where a company will buy the heat uh, and sell it at a at a benefit to everybody, the data center and the, and the end user, and 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 it will be a commercial operation. It'll have benefits societal wide. It'll have energy CO2 benefits, and it will basically close the loop and keep the you know keep the energy. Uh, in the in the, in the loop and not be wasting it, and this will be an opportunity to to, 
to um, show that the uh, data centers can be integrated into the public and energy infrastructure. So the, the future, the power distribution, as you can see from this drawing, everything <clears throat> would be able to talk to each other. Things will be able to turn on and off. Equipment will be able to know that the grid needs to be balanced. Frequency needs to be balanced. Somebody, one area doesn't need, uh, can turn off some equipment at some time and supply that equipment, that, that load to another area. Um, batteries, electric vehicles can be aggregated together to become a virtual power station when they're not required to be used if people are at work or not in offices or not using this load can be sent, this capacity or load can be sent to other areas uh, through the internet of things and the, and the, um, and the, the, the digital networks. Uh, this is critical to reducing our energy energy consumption and to making cities and, and towns and communities smarter. So this is a, a this is a beneficial thing that, that that the digital kind of superhighway and the 5G networks are going to aid. Um, so to summarise, the ICT sector is expected to consist of 20% of global electricity used by 2030, which is a which is a, a very serious amount of of energy. So it needs it's a, it's an area that needs to be to be kept an eye on um, optimization of these of these um, centres and uses use of energy is 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 a key for this. There is a I think it's in Sweden. There's a currently a um, a data centre that has a PUE of, of 0 0.06, which means that three percent of the power for that is currently being used for the um, for the um, uh, for the server power and the equipment is is only used for cooling, which is a very very good ratio. These kind of optimization keys and, and statutory instruments in Europe and directives will complement the EU Green Deal and the circular economy, where we keep to the principles of the best use of resources, not just not just extracting more and more and throwing things away. And I suppose one of the bigger ones for me in equipment and device use is the eliminate the designed obsolescence that appears to be in many things, as uh, we currently use. Uh, uh, we we re repair reuse about 20% of our of our uh, IT and devices. 20% of phones are recycled. And um, I read a funny uh, one the other day that uh, on average, the lower end of quality of printers work for about five print for actually five to seven hours, and then parts of them breaks and they become obsolete or dumped. Um, one last thing just for us to reflect on while we we're all while we were all on this on this webinar is that we're all none of us have gone traveled anywhere so far we've no flights no emissions due to this webinar which is a good thing uh, we're sitting around offices we could look at our devices and our equipment and uh, consider what could be doesn't need to be reduce our amount of devices and what doesn't need to be dumped what can be repurposed reused recycled um, and just on the networks, then um, I just a little a little nugget here that if we reduce the our load on the networks, it can reduce the energy requirements as well. Because um, an email without attachments and lots of images use about 13 watts of energy, and where you send an attachment, sometimes we uh, personally as well, we don't need to. It can use us 166 watts of energy, and there's billions of them going around the world every day. So that's a lot of energy that could be reduced if we kind of are aware of what what our um, what our issues are. So thanks a million for that. Um, there's a question now at the end. Uh, if you could, if you would like to to to, to log in, scan the QR code on your Slido and and just um, give me a rating of how important you think digital infrastructure is to energy efficiency. And we'll be watching the scores on that. And if you have any questions uh, in the future, you could direct them to myself or Seamus Hoyne, the head of the the, the development unit. Uh, and I will. I think we're going to have a question and answer um, session at the end of this. So thanks a million. I'll pass you back to the moderator. And thanks a million, Salam from Ireland. Take care. Thank you, Benny. Thank you, Benny, for our, for this excellent presentation. Um, well, we have seen that this was a very good overview of mitigation and adaptation issues uh, uh, dealing with uh, with the ICT topics. Um, Thank you. Melissa, what about uh, the Slido? Yes, so I came back to the, the slide, the slide, Benny. I hope you don't mind uh, mm -hmm. so people could, could answer it. Um, yeah, good. So 
you guys know if you have joined our webinars in the past that we do use Slido a lot for uh, interaction and polls. So uh, everything is explained in the left column of this slide. You can just uh, scan the image uh, with your phone, for example, or join directly on slido.com using the, the code you see there, eSufficiency3, and then you can answer the question. And there will be also other questions from our other speakers, so we really encourage you to uh, to join us now because it will be also useful for you after. I see now we have 14 people who have joined and we are 29 in the webinar, so I think we can still uh, give a few more seconds for the ones that would like to join us now. All right, doesn't seem to to grow anymore, so maybe we can uh, leave it at that. Okay. So 43% for f thought that uh, they give eight out of 10 for the importance of digital infrastructure. Do you have any comment, Benny, on the result? Yeah, that's got kind of like the interesting that the seven percent might think it's not that um, important because I suppose from my knowledge of energy management uh, interaction between data and analytics and, and different devices talking to each other is quite important. You know, they reckon energy efficiency can reduce emissions and energy use by um, 30 percent. So that's a, a, an energy reduction tool as well. So things uh, uh, you know, um, devices need to be able to talk to each other and communicate, and I suppose machine learning and algorithms need to be able to. So without the high-speed networks and the, the low latency, it's not going to work as well, I would consider. Okay, thank you very much, Benny. Um, okay. So now we will give the floor to the next speaker, Bella, Bella Lotto from Hello. Paris. Hello, Bella. Hello. Hello there. Is there anybody? Yes, we. we it's, yeah. it's okay. Thank you. Thank you. I can hear you. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Sorry. Um, how green is your IT? This is a, a proposal. Um, as you can see, good morning, everybody. Thank you for this invitation. I'm very glad to be here. Uh, as you can see, I have founded Point de Mir, and, uh, and is a, which is a non-profit organization, and Mir Conseil Formation uh, in Paris, and now in south of France, in Provence, with a sunny sky today. And I have been working on sustainable IT since 2012. Um, I hope my English won't be too bad. And my purpose here is to lay some basic knowledges uh, on the subject on sustainable IT. Or IT. Uh, I'm going to, to turn off my camera because of my connection, which is not so fine today. And I, I hope it will be okay for you. Um, so uh, let's, let's uh, have a look at the at the mini quiz, uh, the Slido. Uh, I'm trying to to move my slide, but unfortunately, it doesn't work. I'm trying again. Yeah. You were oh. back on the on the left screen, Bella. Okay. That's why. Okay. It's I will. Next time. Yeah. I will try to remember. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so I was uh, this. The question was among these three tips, which one with the most impacting on our environment so um i invite you to to try to, to answer um, it's a really really good start and i'm going to just wait a few seconds just to 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 see if everything is going well and it's, it's starting very very well the suspense is raising it was raising yes 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 <laughs> For the moment, 91% for extracting manufacturing. So it's a, a simplified um, life, life cycle, as you can see. Um, okay, for the moment, it's uh, 
it's really nice. So um, maybe I can I can continue my my way. Um, just one second. <laughs> I'm trying to to remember the up. Not not so good for me. Well, some people are, are, have chosen usage. Why not? Nobody end of life. That's very interesting. So I'm trying to move the Melissa help. <laughs> yes, <laughs> sorry. This I was great. trying to guide you yeah, through the, the menu. You know, maybe then go there next time. I will do it for you now, and let yeah. me know if you can do it. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, so um, in in 2019, the digital world is world is made up of 34 billion equipments with around 4 billion users. Uh, for example, eight pieces of equipment per user. Today, uh, as we can see, 50% of the worldwide population is connected to the internet through several digital devices. The size of the digital universe could have been multiplied by three or five from 2010 to um, 2025. Indeed, according to a recent study, the number of devices will raise, rise sorry, drastically because of the connect, of connected devices, 5G, the doubling of the average screen size, including television sets, as you know, declining energy efficiency gains, the electricity production of emerging countries, which often has a greater impact than uh, that of Western countries. Um, Maybe we could go to the next. Uh, so sorry, um, the data just on the the, the last one. Uh, data will be multiplied by five from 2018 to 2025. So it's really interesting to have this in the, in the head. The life cycle. I can't even. Yeah, uh, most of the users think. And this is a, a real diffic difficulty. Most of the users think that IT and internet are magical, really magical. We all know that uh, our digital world is not immaterial. The problem is what's going on behind the screen. Our computer or our smartphone don't smell anything. They don't spit any black smoke. They seem to be so clean. So that's a miracle. As you can see, a product or a service goes through several phases. You all, everybody know that. Extracting manufacturing, uh, I'm sorry, this is in French. So extracting manufacturing, distribution, usage, and end of life. And it's very important to visualize everywhere and every, every time the whole picture to have a systematic view. So if we if we simplify uh, this life cycle in the next slide, thank you. There are a lot of impacts at each stage. The first one, and it's really the very important one. This stage represents 80 percent, 80 percent on the environment environmental impacts, and this is the most important point to remember, for my part. For instance, 50 different metals are used to build a smartphone and even more to build a laptop, about 70. 70. Metals are limited in their quantity on Earth. This is what we call resources depletion. For some of them, worldwide stocks are limited to less than a generation, a generation. The European Union publishes every three years the list of the critical raw material. It's very interesting to, to read it. Um, I think there is about 20 or 25 materials, different materials. To obtain metals, we need to extract minerals through mining. And this industry is an incredibly dirty industry. A huge quantity of rocks have to be destroyed, water, 
and solvents have to be used only to get a tiny quantity of metals. Pollutions, child exploitation, violation, violation sorry, of labor law, population displacement, etc. As we see, there are not only um, environmental impacts, of course. Working conditions also in electronic manufacturing are also catastrophic, and we can even talk about e-slavery. Uh, next step, stage, uh, next stage, yes, uh, usage, no, ne ne the other, yes, thank you. Next step of the life cycle, usage. Um, this stage is mostly about consumption, electricity of terminals, networks, and water, for example, for cooling, data centers, etc. In end of life, measuring is difficult at this stage. Several points, pollutions, pollution of water, of air, soil, water tables, for example, health and human impacts. The problem is that regular e-waste collection is insufficient and the illegal export is a big scandal. You can see an example with the famous Abbott Bloshi watching the film Welcome to Sodom, if you want. It's an extraordinary film documentary. For the next slide, we can see uh, we can select four environmental indicators. Uh, these four indicators are only partially reflect the environmental footprint of the digital world. My point uh, here, and this is very important for me, my point here is to say that digital footprint is not only a question of energy consumption, not only a question of greenhouse gas emission. I know you know that, but I'm glad to, to emphasize this point. Uh, our four indicators are abiotic resource depletion. This indicator is expressed usually in antimony equivalent. Global warming, as you know, this indicator expressed in a equivalent, a CO2 equivalent. Energy balance and tension on fresh water. Energy balance, uh, it's very important to know and to, 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 yes, to have in the head that in the digital domain, depending on the stage of the equipment life cycle, different primary energies are used to produce final energy. So electricity is not an indicator, an environmental, environmental indicator, but primary energy is an indicator. So uh, the, the picture is a little bit bigger in the next slide, and many, and we can see many others, uh, other impacts as air pollution, soil pollution, loss of biodiversity, and uh, there are other big social, very big social and human issues like indecent salary, labor abuses, conflicts, like in Democratic Republic of Congo, for example, we're talking about here about conflict minerals or um, blood minerals, as we say. E-waste and illegal export, despite the Basel Convention, which control, controls cross-border movements. Uh, let's see some key, fig key figures in the next slide. Uh, I put uh, the world and France on the right and world on the left, according to a recent report, GreenIT.fr, in November um, 2019, uh, if I remember. And you can see the four indicator, and then uh, we can see that um, we can see that um, the global, uh, the greenhouse gas emissions or digital world have exceeded those of civil aviation. I'm sorry, Benny, but we don't have exactly the same figure that could be uh, discussed later. Uh, as we can see, France, because we are also at 4%, uh, approximately. As we can see, France is not a good student, uh, uh, not at all. We have in France also 11 uh, devices on average per user compared to eight worldwide. So we are very 
bad. Um, in the next slide, I just wanted to, uh, to focus on uh, the problem of recycling because uh, recycling in digital technology is a real, real problem, um, technically and financially. Uh, here you can, and technically, here you can see a generic smartphone, uh, a very um, good um, photography. And this, uh, the circles indicates, the circles, the blue and, and the black ones, uh, indicate metals with, with recycling rates less than 1%. We absolutely have to be conscious that circular economy now is only a dream, but, and it's urgent to think re-employment rather than uh, think, thinking recycling. To give a second life for each equipment, this is the, this is the more important. So um, to, to end my, my, my little story, um, if we had just one thing to remember, this should be, uh, if we want to diminish the environmental impact of the IT, this would be extending the lifespan of equipment. This is just one thing to remember. And the other one is, uh, as a conclusion, it's that uh, digital technology has to be considered as a non-renewable critical resource in less than a generation. That's it for me. Um, I just wanted to, to put some basics and to which should, would be uh, discussed later if we had time. So um, have a nice webinar, a webinar with the other speakers and thank you for your attention. Many thanks, Bella. It was also very inspiring um, speaking. Um, so, before giving the floor to the next speaker, uh, you talk about a film, a movie, Bella. So, if you can write in the chat the name of the film for everybody. Please. Yes, I'm going to. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, so, uh, our next speaker is Xavier, Xavier Verne. So Xavier uh, is working for SNCF and also is a consultant for the SHIFT project, but he will explain this to us just now. Xavier. Yeah, yeah. do you hear me? Yes, perfectly. Yes. So thank you everyone for being here. I'm, I'm very thrilled to be here with you and uh, I will talk uh, um, a bit more about rebound effect and what we can do transitioning with the uh, Bella presentation uh, just before. So once again, please stay focused in the next, uh, in the next uh, 30 minutes. I know it, it can be long and sometimes uh, when doing this kind of event online. So thank you. So just to start with, uh, if I take the control, um, I think we prepared a question on Slido. So you can go to Slido just before I go back. I'm Xavier Verne. I'm working for the SNCF, French transport leading company, and for the Shift project. And we have a, an ICT group in the Shift project. So the Shift pro project, as you may know, is uh, um, was created by Jean-Marc Jankovici and is a, a think tank. Basically, we are a non-profit organization. All data and uh, reports that we publish are public and you can uh, you can source everything uh, that we do on our website, which is uh, shiftproject.org. So um, I, I wrote to, to participate in writing two uh, to reports uh, in the last few years, few years regarding uh, what we call sob sobriety, digital sobriety. So on the, quiz, uh, on the quiz to transition with the uh, Bella presentations, we have a question. So Melissa gave you um, a few hint. Uh, the question is, which percentage of electronic goods here recycled uh, 2019 worldwide? So the question is for the world. So what would you say 
So at the moment, most people say less than 10%. It's okay if we show the results, Melissa. And um, so the, the answer, the correct answer is between 10 and uh, 20. It's 17%. So, so it's better that what Melissa uh, uh, gave you because she she focused on very low rate recycled metals and uh, rare uh, grounds, but uh, at the world worldwide it's seventeen percent. So it's still very low. So, uh, so circular economy is a, is a myth regarding digital at the moment, and uh, in Europe. Just, just to know, to let you know, we are we are doing way better. We are recycling, uh, you know, maybe more than half, more than half of our electronic waste goes into, you know, D E E E filière, which is détroisé in French. So I don't know the translation, but go into the into into the right uh, the right uh, mull and the right trash. So just to understand this gray energy, uh, Benny, uh, Benny presented you a uh, data center Irish situation and that uh, efforts towards uh, neutrality. But I just wanted to, to insist and to bring into real the fact that uh, data centers uh, and the utilization phase, uh, phase here, uh, as you can see, is only 20% of the wall. So basically, when uh, Google tells tells you it's going to be neutral and Microsoft and the other cloud provider, so this carbon neutrality claim is um, is very partial because they they just forget to to, to take into account the the make of all these uh, computers, the fabrications. So the manufacturing all all this uh, is not take, taken taken into account. So they would say we are neutral, but it's only energy consumptions uh, so that's a start but it doesn't address the, this whole systemic problem that we have which is basically regarding green, greenhouse gases emission we have a systemic problem you cannot say i will solve the network uh, emissions uh, for example and and the problem is solved it's done there is no obvious culprit in this whole story so thank you marilor uh, d3e it's w e e e Acronym. Um, so let's let's make together, um, um, you know, a, a self-thinking uh, experimentations right now. So let's imagine you're a renter on the left. Uh, so you rent a flat in a building, and um, each month you you would pay 100 euros uh, to heat you, so to warm you at 18 degrees. And uh, one day uh, your owner. Uh, of the building invested in a new boiler, new heating system, which is way way more efficient. Uh, so you get a cho you get a choice. Each month you can still uh, invest 100 euros and get 20 degrees in your living room, or you would just save money and stay at 18 degrees for half the money, 15 15 bucks a month. So the question would be, what what would you do? And this is rebound effects. Most people we just turn off the temperature, turn on, and and increase their comfort level. So uh, me first. So I'm just I just want to blame anyone. Don't blame anyone. But but the question is uh, if everyone does that, this is rebound effect. We reinvest all technological technologic improvement into more consumptions, and in uh, IT. It's happening so much. Uh, I just gave you here this uh, TV example, but uh, it's happening at the wall in the digital. Uh, as we improve technology, we are using so much more. For example, on TV uh, and streaming industry, TV makers develop high resolution screens to be, you know, to be first and to be very competitive and to have better products to sell and then uh, Netflix and other content provider enforce higher default resolution. For example, uh, since last year, if you want to be broadcasted uh, Netflix premium, you need to you need to provide video uh, in 4K. Uh, otherwise, they would refuse to, to broadcast your movie. So all video industry 
upgrade their equipment, their infrastructure, their you know processing, post-processing, uh, filmmaking productions, and then you can offer higher resolution to consumers, and then people consume it more and more, and especially in mobile, as uh, as Benny uh, explained, brought into relief, and then network providers need to upgrade their infrastructure to cope with it. And uh, and then TV makers to stay uh, to stay first, keep on improving uh, resolutions because you know content is available to to enable uh, better visualization. So so this is rebound effect and it goes on and goes on and goes on. So 2G, 3 3G, 4G, 5G uh, is is in the this this scheme very, happening very much. Um, and this is happening with the 5G. So in France, I don't know for the rest of Europe mostly, but uh, in France, it, it, it's, it's a big debate and lots of people uh, are against 5G. And I'm not, I'm not talking here about uh, if 5G is good or not. For the SIF project, the question is not that this is the wrong question. If you have go, if you go for 5G or if you are against it, so at the shift project, what you do is we compare environmental environmental costs on the left, uh, and what what are the opportunity opportunities to save carbon at the end of the day, and uh, once we do that, we are able to say this technology is good uh, is good unless we we don't apply it uh, correctly, and for 5G. We have a method problem because in France we didn't ask what is it for, what utility 5G will have in our real life. So uh, we we don't exactly know at what uh, use it's gonna be uh, it's gonna be uh, happening. So we don't really know. We don't really know either what is the environmental costs. Operators like uh, Orange, or the SFR, and other O2 uh, uh, mobile uh, providers. Uh, are in the process of computing uh, what it uh, what it will mean regarding energy consumption, for example, but it's not public, and uh, I'm not sure they will publish. But it's because uh, uh, first numbers and first figures are very bad because uh, energy consumption will increase. They would they will tell you that for one byte that is transmitted, uh, it's uh, ten time ten times better than as far as energy consumption is concerned, but it is true, but because of rebound effect, we are we will be able to consume more and more and more and more. So we don't know uh, environmental costs at the moment. And regarding this impact, what is the best deployment strategy? We could start with uh, big cities or only with factories or only where this is uh, vital. Uh, so in France, we, we decided to deploy everywhere regardless uh, this impact. So for me, this is a very bad method. If we don't learn right method to, you know, to to think about the technology we want to we want to deploy worldwide or in our countries, we, we are doomed. It's gonna, we're not going to make the two degrees. Um, finally, for a small organization, um, because uh, I suspect most of you belong to some kind of small organization, like between five and uh, thirty people, what, what could you do to 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 decrease your carbon uh, digital footprint? So at the device and users level, maybe you could value B BYOD strategy. So bring your own device, for example. Uh, if you help your uh, your employee, employees to use their own computer instead of uh, providing them one, maybe you can support them, like maybe 100 euros a year, because it it's, it's, it saves you money because you don't buy another computer or one more smartphone for your employees. So maybe think about that. You should protect your devices. So regarding breakage. One one breakout of two on mobile, for example, it's uh, screen broken or battery uh, needs to be changed. So it's very uh, easy at the moment to extend a smartphone lifespan, not up to 10 years because it's going to get obsolete, but uh, but maybe uh, four and five years. Uh, on this regard, you can take a look at Fairphone, which is a very, really nice project to, to know it very well. 
and you could try to buy fixable things. So there are a few websites, for example, I fix it that gives a you know a, a, a mark out of ten if it's re fixable easily or not. And you should and you should question your 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 need. At the network level, use Ethernet when possible. It's better uh, energy consumption uh, at the energy at the consumption level, sorry, uh, than the other um, wireless networks uh, means. Use Wi-Fi when possible and use 4G, 5G only if impossible to do otherwise. Uh, you could also shut down all boxes. For example, in France, boxes uh, a few a few years ago was up to 0.5 percent of uh, all France uh, energy consumption because you know during overnight your your internet box is useless basically and at the data center level even even if you don't uh, have a data center yourself you can think about uh, escaping from Google Drive and Dropbox and so on there are in France uh, uh, in France mostly there are lots of things uh, that are developing regarding uh, Nextcloud uh, open source solutions. So lots of people start to sell uh, Google Drive equivalents uh, with Visio, with uh, collaboration on uh, documents uh, and uh, messaging, uh, replacing WhatsApp. So this is a nice move to escape from GAFAM and uh, to gain privacy uh, over your exchanges. Uh, over your exchanges. And if you choose one cloud storage provider, stick to it. If you go Dropbox, put all your data into it just to prevent having like Dropbox plus Google Drive plus uh, Microsoft OneDrive and so on. Um, I think that's it. Uh, I very thank you and I'm welcoming your questions afterwards. Melissa, I... I give you thank back. You. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you for this also excellent, uh, excellent uh, presentation. I come back. Hello. <laughs> um, so um, there was a good examples of dimensional sufficiency. Um, I mean about the correction of the dimensioning of equipment and so on. Uh, so thank you. We will uh, we work uh, uh, about it so thank you very much so we are going uh, to to give the floor to the to the last speakers because uh, xavier the and the other speakers the, the question and exchange will uh, will take place after after the presentation so our next speakers is anna anna tizov anna is working for Sweden. i don't know it's the right correct pronunciation in so we get engineers and consultants in the Netherlands and uh, she is also um, the coordinator of the Mobistai project so Anna thank you thank you so much and thank you for the invitation to the webinar um, perhaps my story and my presentation will be a bit different um, to the previous uh, presentations but I hope yeah, you will find it interesting it's not so much on the uh, specific to the IT, but more on the application within the built environment and how can we use different ICT tools to support our behavior uh, in our homes, in commercial buildings, in our offices towards a more energy efficient behavior. Uh, and I will try to do a bridge between the digital sufficiency, um, energy efficiency and energy sufficiency. So, yeah. Um, so yeah, um, I will introduce you our project, our uh, Horizon Euro project that was running from October 2016 until June 2020. So it's already a concluded project. And here we were working with 10 partnering organizations. Um, this project was quite a multidisciplinary project. So we were requiring disciplines and expertise um, from different yeah, fields. Um, we had um, IT partners, we had partners uh, responsible for social sciences and anthropology, so how can we talk with users in the buildings. We had Whirlpool as a white goods provider in our homes. Then we had several universities um, with expertise 
in indoor environment, in energy, uh, energy use, and in health. Here we had partners uh, on, uh, from Maastricht University on human biology. And then we had also Tauron as a big energy provider in Poland. And um, yeah, three IT developers, demo consultants from the Netherlands, Holonix, uh, also solution uh, IoT or yeah, Internet of Things, and also IT solutions provider from Italy and high skills company based in Portugal. So, why did we uh, require such a multidisciplinary team? Because what, where we started in Mobistal was with the thing that in today's life, all of us, most of us, know less about the buildings in which we spend most of our time than what we know about the cornflakes we had for breakfast or core coat we wore this morning. Maybe now with work from home, you don't wear a court, uh, coat in the morning, but I still believe that many of you can relate to this. And um, so our question here was really, what is the impact of such a poor human building relationship and interaction of us within the buildings? Why don't we relate with our buildings that much as we do about the food we eat? Um, so here, uh, already previous speaker, Xavier talked about the rebound effect, but you can, you know, you, you can see such examples on a, a product level, but you can also see it on a building level. And what uh, this is a study done by our partners um, in Movistar project at Tolberg University in Denmark. And what, they sh what this uh, study showed, they analyzed uh, theoretical and actual um, energy consumption of 230,000 residential homes. And what you can see here is that for buildings with the most energy efficient labels, so where energy label is A, actual consumption was much higher, two to three times higher than it was the predicted uh, consumption. And where for buildings where the energy label was worse, so energy label G, actual consumption was much lower, 30 to 40 percent lower than the theoretical calculated consumption. So what we can see here is that basically legislation dictates how much it should be, but actually users really use energy in the end. So what we should here shift is from understanding that buildings use energy to, sorry, to actual fact that people use energy. And that when we talk about energy efficiency, it's really about buildings, buildings technology. That's also what previous speakers were talking about. But when it comes to energy sufficiency, we're talking about people, about people's behavior. And here we should more concentrate to really analyze who are the users that are really wasting energy and do, are not even aware of. Also, some previous speakers mentioned that we don't even know what we do not know. And how can we now organize different knowledge campaigns, awareness campaigns to make them realize that their current behavior in, in buildings is not, um, yeah, is not energy efficient or it's not, it's not uh, most optimal and try to change their behavior to become more energy conscious. So here, what is important for us is the, the, one of the paradigm shifts that we took into account is that to go from buildings can be regulated to facts that people, buildings can be, we can um, regulate technologies, but what we cannot do is regulate people. People are not machines and it might sound quite hard to say so, but people do what they want. So. When, when we went uh, into development of different solutions in Mobistyle, we really ask ourselves, who are our users? So first start to identify actual people in the building. Of course, we were part of a research project, so you have much more efforts and time to do such a thorough analysis. But there are a lot of concepts, methodology that can be implied on a bigger um, building areas to scan re and really see who are you solving the problem for, uh, instead of just always um, be uh, inventing new solutions, developing new solutions, but rather look how people use existing technologies and try to adapt the current technologies to feed better the needs of actual users and people. Because oftentimes we saw we had one uh, demonstration case in Slovenia, which was one of the smartest buildings uh, in Europe, but people just didn't know how to use the building. They were covering sensors with papers just so they didn't get too much fresh air in the, in the room. And I believe that there are quite some examples similar that you all also know of. 
So in Mobistal, as I said, we first went to see who are our users in the buildings, people in the buildings. And here we had five demonstration cases in different countries. Um, so we had the residential as non-residential buildings, uh, people from different economic, cultural, geographical background. And another uh, conclusion here that we took or paradigm shift was that a lot we are focusing in uh, IT world or in energy um, uh, world on automation. However, what we are stating is beside automation include information. So there's nothing, it's not that uh, it's yeah black or white, it's really just to complement each other that people really need to understand um, the reason for the technologies and what they can do and to go from more passive users to more active co-creators. So um, in that way, we developed um, yeah, different behavioral change objectives uh, for our um, users in different demonstration buildings. And what we also analyzed is what kind of technologies and um, solutions people are already using. So if they are already using certain dashboards that are showing them energy consumption, if, even if it is just simple data visualization, to see how they understand this information so far and how can we really develop these tools further so for example when you have a simple um, energy data visualization over time do they really understand what mean mean uh, some peak on the graph or how can we really make sense out of this data so in that way we were connecting different data types in different buildings and what mobistyle was really um, innovative about that we were looking on how can we look at the different fields together. So about the field of indoor environment, health, personal health and well-being in the buildings uh, and uh, correlated this to the energy use of building. Um, so in that way, we were developing different solutions. Um, we had a game which was more intended for um, residential homes. So what we noticed is, for example, we first had an assumption that people will find augmented reality as something um, really triggering for them. However, they were looking for quite simple solutions for homes they wanted to look, um, they, they were looking for some more um, information in a fun way. So here we were using gaming uh, features, then dashboard was used for non-residential homes and office app uh, was used for office spaces. Um, and then once we developed those solutions, went back to the user to check, is that really something that is solving their needs? Is it something that they want? Do they find it uh, useful? Do they even know how to use? Because that's also one of the uh, lessons learned that oftentimes what we see is that people think they know how they use it or they think they are efficient and optimal with their behavior in buildings. But that's when you look at the data, that's not really the case. So it's really important even sometimes it's enough to just collect few data types, but really make sense out of these data, make information that it's um, interesting for users, then just overwhelm users with too much technology. And here we were also using um, yeah, current technology principles for development of these tools. Um, and also I must say that all the IT partners in our consortium, all the three companies that uh, are yeah have quite a well, good or um, huge portfolio um, of different projects and solutions available on the market. Um, they learned really from Movistal that working with these people-centered or anthropological uh, pre-requirement as a start before actually developing solutions was very valuable for them. And they learned quite a lot. Hmm? Oops. Sorry, Melissa, can you? It was not meant to go to the video. It was just their link. Melissa? Yes, sorry. I just noticed that I don't know why the, the screen stopped sharing. I'm sharing it now. So okay. I think now you can go back. Sorry. sorry. Yeah, since presentations will be shared with you afterwards, I inserted some links so you can see uh, actual uh, demonstration projects a bit more thoroughly. Um, yes, so here are just some uh, final recommendations that we came uh, to at the end. So what was quite um, 
important was really to also um, incorporate those ICT solutions. So ICT solutions cannot be seen as standalone solutions. They really have to be uh, integrated in part of uh, either is facility management, community building. So it has to be also uh, supported with different, more uh, multi-channel campaigns. Um, there, of course, what, the, what we also realized is that there is no one-fit-all solution. Uh, furthermore, uh, as I mentioned, the current technology principle, minimalistic solutions. Um, uh, then also what was quite relevant for us was, of course, hearing other people, again, to be including other decision maker. Uh, then what we also say, said is that uh, Mobistal yeah, is moving people so on stairs as in their mindset. So it's really something that behavior change as such is quite a complex, pro uh, complex problem. Or, um, yeah, and therefore you have to really look at it holistically from different point of view, really try with small steps instead to overwhelm people at the start. For example, when we were deploying game, we had few deployment steps. So we started first with few actions uh, for users to improve their behaviors at home. And then we were adding actions. We didn't do all actions at first, all the missions at first, so people could really adapt in slow steps and that they had really this feeling that they are in control, not that the technology is in control. And in that, we got quite some savings. And uh, one of the last um, important um, lessons that we we really saw when talking with people is that especially of course we can see that today with COVID-19 situation that health is really today's wealth so a lot of time when we are communicating for example importance of better ventilation or of a good indoor climate it's important that we are stating that this is not to lower down energy consumption of a building but really um, to improve uh, indoor climate of people um, in those buildings. So um, what we try to look in Movistal is also to not think of what is comfortable and, and especially understand that comfort is not necessarily equal to health and that the comfort we know in the last hundred years has not been there previous and that our bodies can adapt to different conditions and that we should start shifting temperature indoors from uh, yeah to, to allow dynamic conditions and in that way we allowed lower temperatures in office spaces in the morning so when occupants can come in the building there's 18 degrees especially in the netherlands it's quite common to have 22 23 degrees indoors um, but if you allow lower temperatures in the morning and then again in the afternoon of course i think it's quite logical that you can achieve some energy saving and we had in our demonstration case we proved 21% of energy saving, that's average, so looking at the heating and cooling, um, saving for uh, dynamic conditions applied in the office spaces compared to static. And uh, while you are, while we were looking, of course, at the psychological response of people while giving them feedback through our ICT solutions, we were also measuring physiological response. And uh, this was, of course, our uh, campaigns were too short, but we have quite some um, research done by our partner Maastricht University in lab works where they really prove that it, this improves our health on long term it um, increases our metabolic rate um, blood flow so circulation and on long term can help towards decrease of uh, risk for cardiovascular diseases so um, just to conclude Yes, uh, what we see with the, all the legislation, with EU transition, all the goals uh, that energy efficiency is at the heart of EU transition towards sustainable future. However, that's not the case for building uh, users or for people in general. Um, what is important for us as people is really health is today's wealth. You can see that people don't wear a Rolex, people are wearing smartwatches with heartbeat uh, measurements, etc. And Therefore, uh, what it is important when we are promoting solution, and here I'm not just talking about developing new solutions, also about existing solutions that we should sometimes ask ourselves, do those solutions really serve people's needs? And what we really try to emphasize that we saw that um, the, the solutions work um, were those where we were looking for uh, overlap between um, goals and ambitions on energy efficiency, good indoor environment and health, and especially, of course, 
the way you communicate um, this information to users. And so in the end, the energy conscious and healthy behavior becomes a way of life and not just one time service as energy saving at the end of the month that people notice on the energy bill because yeah, we see that, that there's no impact. Um, so yes, that would be end of my presentation. Uh, of course, if you want to know more, you're welcome to visit our website. Again, you can also ask questions today. The, the, inf the information will be shared with you after this. So you have, I believe, all information there, all the links. So yeah, thank you so much again for the opportunity. Thank you, Ray. Thank you very much, Anna. Um, so <laughs> I noticed that uh, digital can be both your, your BFF and your annoying little brother or something like that. It depends. So and for if you want that your digital to be your best friend forever, it is important to to advise, to support uh, each stakeholder from the extraction manufacturing to 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 the users um so now we have 15 minutes for an open discussion so uh, we put two two questions um uh on the slide which means and tools to facilitate digital sufficiency at home at work and in the public space how can i positively influence the people around me and encourage them to adopt eco-responsible attitudes and gestures with ICT. Um, maybe I have one first question, maybe for, for Bonnie. Um, uh, Bonnie, you, you spoke about the data centers in, in Ireland. Um, maybe could you um, detail uh, how do you what, what about data center which, which uh, sort, uh, which kind of advice, supports, and so on uh, to help uh, them to, to decrease users, to, to increase efficiency and efficiency and decrease consumption and uh, climate uh, problems? Uh, hi, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, okay. So I suppose in my li little bit of research this in the last week or so, uh, to step in for Seamus, uh, closing the loop, uh, we, we would be very strong in, our, in Ireland and in the LIT. We've done some uh, um, uh, retrofit and deep retrofit projects of buildings, commercial and and uh, domestic. We've we've noted as um, as Anna has said and um, and Xavier the the the, the Jevons effect, you know the bounce back effect, the performance gap where energy you know people can change the energy uses of buildings, and also this can be a thing in data centres. Uh, I suppose where the the biggest one for me would be the load is going to be the energy load outside the embodied energy of the building and the equipment um, is going to increase exponentially over the next years and there's a thing that probably needs to be addressed the uh, recycling reuse and um, you know um, reducing the, um, the, 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 the the waste of the equipment also is, is going to be a big thing because that that has an effect around the world and globally um, the waste heat that is generated through the electrical equipment being utilized to me is a very important thing that should be um directed into into use as that energy has been used to already so to just dumping it dumping it into the atmosphere to me is not a good thing even if it's free cooling free air it should be utilized for 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 heat loads on other buildings um <clears throat> uh the, the and i suppose another thing as, as anna said that without data we don't know what's got you know we just have opinions on how how uh, occupancy and um opposed to uh, you know the performance gap of buildings is is actually performing so when we have the more data we have the more we can we can figure out how, ways to increase efficiency like as the as as she said reducing temperatures in the morning i i ran a a scheme in an office block where we we um when i was the energy manager where, where we upgraded it and you could have people within two meters of each other been having different um, issues one was it could be too hot or too cold so i suppose getting a balance is can be difficult people have different um different views on 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 on, 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 on 
on the climate they're sitting in. So I suppose the more information we have, the more we can figure out the way forward. It really needs to. We need to close the gap between between um, uh, resource uses and 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 uh, and energy use and keep them up kind of together. Over to you now. Oh, sorry, my speakers are gone. Marie Laura, you forgot to unmute yourself. Oh, that's okay. Okay, sorry. <laughs> um, dear participants, <laughs> uh, feel free to ask for some for some uh, question or comments. Also, maybe if you want to uh, to talk about your own projects uh, or to have to if you have testimonies uh, on other examples or other ideas of uh, of uh, the uh, of sufficiency in this uh, digital. Uh, in digital, um, so um, if someone wants to take the floor, it's not a problem. But uh, in the meanwhile, Xavier, I have a question about the um, in the with the shift project. You you study all these uh, all these issues. Um, did you see? Some consequences from the COVID crisis and so on from this particular period on on the use or maybe on the use uh, in the, in terms of amounts of use or maybe of, in terms of uh, new uh, uh, new tools, new digital tools or something like that. Yeah, um, about COVID crisis, yes. Um, uh, thank you for the question quite interesting uh, so uh, internet did did the job so everybody was afraid in, in the beginning of the covid crisis that it, it would just collapse but it didn't because you know infra infra is is ahead our peak data production and consumption so so it, it was okay even if we ask netflix and disney plus to lower their uh, resolution because video video is huge in the network it's about uh, 80 percent of what of what is transmitted first so uh, so the infrastructures and internet uh, was well because it helped it helped us everyone in our everyday life to to make to make it through this big crisis but afterwards, afterwards, uh, regarding this rebound effect, so you you have all seen, you know, the chase and the competition between Zoom and Cisco web meeting and Teams and so on. So you know, all these cloud providers invested so much data infrastructure to cope with these new needs because everyone is, you know, video conferencing basically uh, most of the day for their remote work so and this is a huge rebound effect so once again uh, i will insist on uh, on um, on saying that uh, all this uh, the way to make uh, the way that we make all data centers is very energy uh, intensive and uh, material intensive and it's not a cloud a cloud is it's quite immaterial but uh, data center are are concrete basically so this is a big rebound effect and we have to take care of that in the next few years because not to 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 respect what Europe did regarding data center energy efficiency and savings that are ahead of us. Okay, thank you, Xavier. Um, I see I see in the in the chat Francesca Francesca Corley, you have a question. Do you want? Francesca, you did have something about 5D. Maybe you, you would explain it. So, so it's connected. Yeah. Well, I, I can. The biggest problem about 5G is in the fact that the increase in use rebound effect will only be about things we already do and not about things that will actually improve our energy use. Yes. Uh, so if I understand the question, so basically uh, the question would be with 5G, is there any new things we can do and will it improve the situation? So basically to make it 
sharp and very very uh, simplified but anyway uh, basically the, we are talking about video because the video is most of what uh, goes uh, through mobile uh, at, at the end of the day so it's 80 percent uh, of all uh, global data and 5g for example it will help a lot what we called i don't i don't know in english maybe it will help me a video surveillance maybe like uh, the way that we put uh, cameras uh, and uh, video system on in, on streets and in buildings to to look at what people do and to and to help everyday life and uh, this is one new uh, usage that can be deployed and it's not possible to deploy in in 3g and 4g because they are too because video is too too heavy for 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 uh for uh, for our day um, 4G everyday um, technology. And uh, the rebound effect is indeed uh, happening in, uh, in South Korea and other Asian. For example, in China, uh, they deployed like eight, um, 80, 80,000 uh, antennas in the last few years, and they increased their consumption, their consumption up to uh, two times, twice the consumption around so there is a huge rebound effect so this is what we are talking with in france when we try to uh, to give obje objectivity to this 5g uh, debate okay thank you oui? may i say just a, a little word to complete um yes, the, the, uh, thank you about the rebound effect uh, for 5g this is also not only in the use but in buying uh, more and more um, devices which will would be compatible, 5G compatible. So this is uh, one once more the the first point to remember. This is like I, I will buy another device to be 5G compatible, and this is a huge rebound effect, not only in the use. I think exactly. Mm -hmm. um, I saw that Maite Garnier from ESPUL had a testimony about a project dealing with digital sufficiency. Maite, do you want to just to explain briefly this project? Um, yeah, I can quickly. Um, so the project was called the Four Bs, and it's very similar to Mobi Style, uh, and actually. Uh, could recall we we met uh, the two teams met at, at uh, the final um, event of uh, the four Bs. Um, it's very close in, in the sense that the project was about equipping different types of buildings with uh, sensors and uh, giving the information back to the, the users to see if um, their behaviors would change. So there was also um elements of behavior change um, and uh, human sciences combined with um, technology and building expertise and uh, we, we also came to the conclusion that health elements were really important to be taken into account for the users and uh, the co-creation with them would really help to adapt to the kind of information they would need to give you an example, um, in a Swiss co-working space, um, the users uh, well, could, for example, view temperature data as well as CO2 uh, data in, indoors. And uh, for temperature, it's the data that people are very used to. If it's 20 degrees, 25, 18, they know what it means. If it's low or high, they can relate to that data. Um, in, in another... Um, when we consider CO2 data, it's about ppm, and they have absolutely no idea if 500 is a lot of indoor CO2 ppm or 300 or 1000. What does it mean? When do I have to open the windows or not? So this that has to be changed to a green red light. So talking with the the persons, then you can adapt. Is if the kind of data you give so you can get a behavior change and action to give you an example thanks okay 
Thank, <clears throat> thank you, Maite. Um, I think uh, Melissa, Melissa, where are you? Yes. Uh, sure. Um, yes. Uh, well, I was looking at the chat and uh, I'm happy that we had so many comments and discussion already in the chat. I think that's a good sign that people were definitely interested. Um, we can still have five more minutes if someone would like to raise one more question. And maybe I would like to, to give the floor one more time to, to Anna, who did not get the chance to, to say some comments after a presentation yet. And I see we're also active in the chat, Anna. So if you have anything to add. No, uh, maybe I'm switching now the topics. But what I was thinking was, beside the topic of Mobistar and um, uh, yeah, occupant behavior or user's behavior in buildings, that I was triggered also but by some common comments of Bela and Xavier um, regarding the that we should extend the life expectancy of the different IT solutions or also what Xavier man, mentioned extended support uh, contract or services and um, in that we had a lot of discussion when it comes to circular economy as such also in built environment that what I think it's maybe more not it's not a question but it's more of the mark that at the moment the problem is still really an, uh, about that we are having product ownership instead of selling or um, offering services because at the moment there is a big difference between who has a power and who has a responsibility because when you are selling a product responsibility for the product will lie with the, the owner of the product afterwards and oftentimes after three four years equipment or, or products stop working but if you're going to start offering a service so that the manufacturer of a telephone for example will also remain responsible for the phone within the next five years and you're only using what we heard at the beginning for the, the digital sufficiency that we're only using phones as for 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 communicating so the, the, what we are kind of paying is communication but not for a product that then we're going to have completely different relationship and then the responsibility will lie with the manufacturer so they will really make sure that the product works for an extended period of time and with a really high quality but the, at the moment most of products are made that they will break within a few years and this is the same what we have what we see in the built environment like um, for example what you're now getting is for that uh, if you are hiring in big commercial spaces uh, lighting instead of buying a bulb you're you're uh, renting a light you want to have sufficient light on your service that people who will install so for example Siemens Philips they will be installing really efficient products because they know that now they are responsible for the product itself Okay, thank you, Anna, for these comments. Uh, there is a, uh, a last question from Benny to Xavier. Xavier, did you see the question or not? I don't know about... No, I'm not sure. Let me know. The 5G device that talks... Would the 5G device that talks yes. to older devices be possible rather yes. than replacing them? Yes, yes, because uh, you know when you when you buy your 5G phone, basically it's 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 2G, 3G, 4G, 5G. It's just a shortcut and it's compatible, so um, you will be able to call uh, a 2G, 3G, 4G cell phone. But maybe you will not make in, in video because the receiver will be uh, 4G or 3G and, and will not be able to cope with all the bandwidth needed to to receive your your phone. But you know, 4G, 5G are just protocols, and it's not a, uh, it's fine. You have to do make the distinction between uh, what 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 you are using for it and this what we're and this is what we are talking about uh, this morning. Okay, thank you. So we have to work more about this. <laughs> This, uh, these topics. <laughs> yeah, of course. Thank you. It's quite <laughs> so, complex indeed. Yes. Um, so um, I think it's time to close the seminar, uh, Melissa. So I would like to thank you, Federen, Melissa, and uh, Dominic, uh, for this opportunity uh, for us in ARC to, uh, to co organize with you this series of webinars uh, dedicated to energy sufficiency. So, this is the third and last webinar of this series, but uh, there will be more 
I don't know, uh, maybe at the, at the end of this of this uh, of this uh, year. Uh, so uh, thank you, everybody. Thank you to our great and excellent speakers this morning. Um, I and also I thank also our participants. Uh, so happy New Year to everybody, and uh, I uh, I hope to see you to see you very soon. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you, Marie-Laure and speakers. Bye. It was Thank very you. interesting. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Take care, everybody. Bye.